Well, tonight I want to go to a study of, begin study of the first general epistle of Peter. And I'm going to spend more time than I usually do on the introduction. One of the things that's easy to do here in the introduction is when you read verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So when we ask, um, who wrote this letter? Well, it's the Apostle Peter. It's so stated in just so many words in the salutation, verse 1 of chapter 1. And when you begin to look at whatever else is available, the internal evidence supports the Apostle Peter as the author. Uh, here's another reason for that. For it was written by one who was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. You find that in chapter 5 and verse 1. <clears throat> As you come sometime later and leave the inspired record, you'll find that early sources in church history attribute the letter to Peter also. Irenaeus in 185 said as much. Clement of Alexandria and about 200 A.D. Tertullian, at the same time, and Eusebius in 300 A.D. All of those fellows said Peter the Apostle wrote the book. Evidently, uh, Silvanus, also known as Silas, was an assistant to Peter. If you look at verse 12 of chapter 5, you'll see that to be the case. And we must realize that he's been around for some time because he's quite a, a well-known prophet and early preacher in the early church. Acts chapter 15, verses 32 through 34. And in that same chapter, verse 40. And on over into the next chapter, Acts 16, verses 19 through 25. And verses 17 through 14. You'll also see that he was joined with the Apostle Paul in writing some of his letters. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1. Now it's interesting to note in that same chapter 1 verse 1. Those who receive this particular letter. Peter tells us that this letter was written to those whom he calls pilgrims who are scattered abroad of the dispersion, chapter 1, verse 1. Now, this term, dispersion, is found in uh, John chapter 7 and verse 35. Originally, it was used to describe the Israelites who had been scattered abroad following the Assyrian and then the Babylonian captivities. Now that would go all the way back to roughly 700, 500 BC. And this has caused many people to suppose that the letter was written to Jewish Christians as was, we think, the letter that James wrote, James chapter 1, verse 1. However, there is an indication that some of his readers were Gentile converts who had come to believe in Christ through Jesus. Chapter 1 and verse 21 might lend a little light to that. He says, of those who will receive this letter, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. I would add this much to it also. God knew that this book would be for all men. He also knew that by the time the first century was over with, there would have been a great influx of Gentile converts. So even though we find the church beginning first among Jews 
And much of the New Testament has to do with the gospel being carried to Jews. We see that Paul is chosen to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and then we study through the book of Acts the three great preaching tours that Paul took. And you'll remember in those tours, he would come, say, into a certain place, there'd be a synagogue, but he would come across Jews that would be converted by his preaching. But then also in that synagogue, they'd be proselytes. So we know that Gentiles all along were being converted. So it's important to realize that this is not just beginning and ending with Jewish Christians, but that God knew this would be for all those who would follow after him faithfully. Peter also applies this term dispersion. And I think really it fits more in this way than the other way to Christians in general. Remember, it's not long after the death of Stephen that they were scattered everywhere preaching the word and went everywhere preaching the word. So Christians were scattered because of persecution and under the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. Uh, remember, let me make this emphasis again, though I'm sure most of you remember it, that in the Greek grammar, the Great Commission actually reads, as you are going, preach the gospel. Now, of course, that doesn't rule out that you can say, I want to go to this country, and I want to preach the gospel to them. But it does say, basically, wherever you go, as you go, you preach the gospel. Because people traveled all over the place, and they were not to forget the commission Christ laid upon them. Wherever they went, they would teach the gospel. That, of course, also tells us why that by the time Paul wrote the first letter to the, or the letter to the Colossians, that he indicates the gospel had been sounded out to the whole world because all the members were teaching. And thus, everyone had had the opportunity. And by the way, that doesn't mean every person had someone teach the truth to them and they either believed and obeyed it or they didn't. It means they had had the opportunity presented to them to hear and know the truth. So notice how he emphasizes in verse 11, as to those he's writing here, how that they're pilgrims. Pilgrims don't put down roots. They travel. They're not, they know they're not in a permanent place. And notice these pilgrims in particular were in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, where are these places today? They're all in what we know as Turkey. Paul had traveled extensively in some of these areas, with Bithynia being the notable exception, Acts 16, 7. That's where he wanted to go there, and the Holy Spirit said, no, go somewhere else. So the gospel had been given much opportunity to spread throughout the region, keeping in mind that every time he converted somebody, that they were to go and convert somebody else. And things get done in, in a hurry and thoroughly when you have that kind of conversion and then someone else converting that person and on and on you go. This we need to realize today and understand that's how it can be done today regardless of modern uh, conveniences that help us like this Zoom meeting speak as we are now. That just gives us even greater opportunity to get the gospel out to people. Now concerning uh, when it was written and where Peter was when it was written, it's generally accepted that Peter died during the reign of Nero. Well, we know from secular history that Nero committed suicide in 68 AD. So the epistle must be dated before then. A common view is that the epistle was written on the eve of the Neronian persecution. It may be even alluded to, and I say maybe, in chapter 4, 
verses 12 through 19. Chapter 4, 12 through 19. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, and so on down through the passage. This would mean that the letter was written sometime around 63 or 64 A.D. But whether it was 63 or 4 or 5 or 62, going back 2,000 years, that, that's pretty narrowing down it, where it, when it was written. Now, Peter says he wrote from Babylon, chapter 5 and verse 13. Well, people have questioned whether it was the literal Babylon, where Iraq is today, and roughly where the Tigris Euphrates rivers uh, flows into the Gulf. Or he's using Babylon as a code name for Rome, or maybe even, as some have thought, Jerusalem itself. Now, here's where when you go to consult the various commentators, commentators and histories. You have people like Barnes and Lightfoot and uh, more scholarly works like James and Fawcett Brown argue that actually Babylon itself, the literal actual Babylon was meant. Then there's a fellow by the name of Kistemacher who points out in five thir about 513 that Mark had been in Rome with Paul during his uh, first and second imprisonment, Colossians 4.10 and 2 Timothy 4.11. And Peter then is linked to Rome with such writers as Papias, who lived around 125 A.D., and Irenaeus, who lived around 185 A.D. While possibly Rome and maybe even Jerusalem, I really think that it means just Babylon. There's no reason to conclude that there's any symbolism in this. He's, there's nothing in the context, uh, immediate or remote, that it is referring in a figurative way to Rome or Jerusalem or any other place for that matter, as Babylon. Um, Peter, remember, was an apostle to the Jews and thus he did his work in that way. But I wouldn't get all bogged down all that other than to know that these are the different views of the hell by scholarly conservative commentators. I would say that we know it's inspired of the Holy Spirit. It's just like getting into a tizzy over what human hand wrote down the letter to the Hebrews. Well, my opinion is it was Paul. But notice I said opinion. I think the weight of the evidence points toward Paul. But I'm not going to place my soul salvation on whether Paul wrote it or didn't, or whether Babylon here is the actual Babylon where Iraq is today or not. But trying to cover all bases to study what we might, it's good to bring those things out. Now, what is the purpose of this particular letter. Well, let's keep in mind that, as we've said most often and time and again, that these letters, most of the letters in the New Testament, was written to individuals and churches concerning being faithful as a member of the church. Now, it's apparent from the epistle that Christians in Asia Minor had experienced persecution. Verse 6 reads, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation or trials. So he's telling them that you've gone through that, but there's more on the way. Chapter 4, 12 through 19, we noted. So throughout the letter, Peter's delivering words designed to encourage, to keep them steadfast. And as we quoted most often, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, 
be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the word of the Lord. And if you look through the epistle, you see in verse 13, that kind of view brought out. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you can find several other places like that in the letter. Chapter 4, verse 16. And chapter 5. Verses 8 and 9. Peter then reminds them of the great blessings they enjoy, but also the obligations that they have that are incumbent really upon everyone who is a Christian and would be faithful to God. This is clear from verse 2. Notice, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. So he knows there are special people. He's one of them. He wants them to remember that they are special. And they're God's own special people. Some things sometimes think we do ourselves a great disservice. Well, we don't remind ourselves that it's God's faithful children. You're very special in his sight. That's not to create pride, not to create haughtiness, or to anything to boast about. It just simply means you're one of the few in all the world to receive with meekness the engrafted word, believe it and obey it, and you're living according. The Lord himself had taught in the Beatitudes about being persecuted for righteousness' sake and pronounced a blessing upon those who were. And this Peter, of course, Peter heard him when he did that. And this Peter now does for these Christians. So the theme of the epistle is one that is filled with I guess we could say practical admonition, always pertaining to how do you live? Christianity is activity, a certain kind of activity, activity guided by the authority of God's word, put into practice by the members of his family. But now he's emphasized we're already to understand that we are sojourners, we're pilgrims. Now, here's the thing we don't understand sometimes. We're living as faithful children of God and pilgrims in a very hostile land, hostile territory. And they are told how to behave in the midst of those who are in the process of speaking evil of them, people who abuse them, people who don't believe the message they preach and simply are opposed to them because they are Christian. So, as one has said, there's an appropriate theme could be conduct becoming the people of God. Or as we've said many times, and there was a bumper sticker out there, although I haven't seen it in years, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And therefore, here's another letter written because God loves us and wants us to remain faithful. As we come on into the book itself, we emphasize again that uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, in fact, we say A, the letter A of verse 1, announces that this is from the Apostle Peter, Apostle Christ. And then it's 2, in chapter 1, B, into verse 2, the pilgrims of the dispersion of God's elect. And this is highly important for us to understand. Because the whole Bible is written by God 
for us. And that's the way we ought to approach it. Now, going back to the text. Let me mention in verse 2 when he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We do well to comment on the word elect because John Calvin in the 1500s has ruined this word as far as his biblical usage. But I don't intend to be run off of a biblical word because most people don't understand it or they use it wrongly. There are people who believe it. The act of baptism is sprinkling water on people. But I don't intend to be run off of the true biblical doctrine of the one baptism in Ephesians 4 or the Great Commission because there are a lot of people, in fact, you might say most people, who don't believe in baptism being a barren water. We just need to speak what the Bible speaks and be silent where it's silent. And it's the same Peter who's going to tell us if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So, he says, elect. Well, God ordained before time was the people who would be saved. Now, in what sense? He ordained that everybody would be saved who would believe and obey the gospel and live faith to the Lord in the Lord's church. Now, those are the elect. When people were baptized for the mission of sins, on the day the church started in Jerusalem, Acts 2, verse 38, believers were told to repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the religious sin. You'll notice verse 47 makes it clear that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Well, those that were saved from their past sin, those that were added to the church of the Lord himself were those that were elected to that position. How so? Because they believed and from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine, Romans 6, Verses 17 and 18. So it's no amazing thing. God's elect are those who receive with meekness the engrafted word. Have faith produced in them, Romans 10, 17, by that word. Obey, Acts 17, 30, repenting of their sins. Confess their faith in Christ and the Son of God, Romans chapter 10, verse 10. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. Acts 2, 38, Galatians 3, 27. There's the process of election. Now, before the world was, God had ordained such so to be. Elect according to the foreknowledge. Well, it's foreknowledge as far as we're concerned. Because we're limited by time and space and yesterdays, todays, and tomorrows. But God's not limited by those things. A day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. But when we, located in time and space, try to refer to things that happened before time and space, then we use the term foreknowledge. If you were to ask God, how long has it been since Christ died on the earth? Well, how would you answer that from God's perspective? No time involved. But if you answer it from our perspective, it's been almost 2,000 years. So elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. How God would save man was in the mind of God before the world was. No afterthought, no accident that he set up the church, but that the church is the realm of the same. The church is the kingdom of Christ. Notice it's through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctified, set apart. And of course, a saint, and every Christian is a saint, has been set apart to faithfully serve God in God's church by their belief and obedience to the gospel. There's the very process of setting a person apart. We're holy in that we're dedicated to that one purpose. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 speaks of 
our yielding our lives living sacrifice, our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. Well, that's because that we've been sanctified in obedience to the gospel, being baptized into Christ. And thus, we're holy. We're dedicated to one purpose. Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the whole duty of man. So the process of sanctification is simply obedience to the gospel. God, we thank that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that doctrine that was delivered to you. They then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. Romans 6, 17, 18. And that form of doctrine is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Now, God ordained all that for the world war. Thus, it was in his foreknowledge, as we would describe it from our perspective. Notice, through sanctification of the Spirit, and then this comes up, which most of the denominational world denies and does not believe. Undue obedience. Well, you are, if you talk to most denominational people, they'll tell you, well, you can't obey in order to be saved. You obey because you are saved. Well, it is true that a person who is a Christian is going to be obedient. That's the very thing he wanted to be to do. But you become a Christian by being obedient also. And that's what's pointed out in Romans 6, 17, and 18. Or as Peter is going to say a little later on in chapter 3, and verse 21, speaking of the flood, and I bore the ark over from the old world into a new world. Peter says the like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So is it any wonder that Peter himself is Luke? by inspiration records when Peter was at the household of Cornelius in Acts 10 and verse 48 commanded those of Cornelius and his household if you have to speak of to be baptized baptized to be saved well, as far as I know that's obedient and that's in harmony with what Jesus said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved Mark 16 and verse 16 and that's what the people did on the day of Pentecost, the day the church started. As believers, they repented and were baptized for the remission of sins. That's what they were told to do in Acts 2, in verse 38. And verse 41 says, Then, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So we see then that obedience is directly connected with becoming a Christian. And obedience characterizes the faithful child of God. And thus, as Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says, Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Well, what if you don't obey? Then you're not going to be saved by him. It's that simple. So unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, which emphasizes that it is the blood Christ shed on Calvary's cross that remits sin. Now, when we're baptized as repentant believers, we're buried with Christ in baptism. Look at verses 3 and 4 of Romans 6. Only then are we raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature in Christ. Why? Because our sins have been remitted, the old man of sin is dead, and we're alive. Well, what did we contact, as it were, when we were buried with the Lord in baptism, baptized into his death? Well, that's where he shed his blood, in his death. And thus, the blood is applied. So, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of blood, of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, it's to those people 
But he says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. What about people who haven't done this? What about those who are not the elect? What about those who are uh, not sanctified by the Spirit? What about those who haven't obeyed God? What about those who haven't been covered and washed clean by the blood of Christ and are obedient to the gospel when they were baptized in the death of Christ? Well, I don't think there's any favor for them. Except that if they will repent of their sins, believing in Christ, and obey the gospel, God will favor them with forgiveness of sin and sonship, even as he's done everybody else that's ever believed and obeyed the gospel. But it's to these people who have done that that he says, favor or grace unto you, and peace be most bad. Notice it's not just have it, but that it be multiplied. When you're being persecuted like these people, then it's good to be reminded why you're being persecuted. It's good to be reminded that this world is not your home, that you're just traveling through. It's good to be reminded that Jesus said, all who live God be in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's good to be reminded that Jesus had taught that while he was on this earth in vaccinating his own disciples against persecution and pronounce the blessing on them. So when you come into verse 3, notice another blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We would appreciate verses like these, especially verse 3 more, if our lives daily stood in jeopardy simply because we were Christians and we would not be to the left or the right of God's word, but we would speak it in its purity and with all boldness as these brethren did so long ago. We would be so glad to know that no matter what men do to us and no matter how painful it might be, that we all have to leave this world anyway. And if we leave this world, let us leave it on God's terms, having been faithful to him. And thus Revelation 2, verse 10 comes up, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So God is blessed. God is uh, said to be wonderful and mighty and great, and we're very thankful to him. That's the idea of blessed to you. Because of what he's done for us because of all of the wonderful love he poured out upon us, the sacrifice of Christ and so on, to make us forgiven of sin. Notice abundant mercy. He's begotten us again. Well, begetting carries with it the idea of a seed. Luke 8, verse 11 says, the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And James talks about being begotten. It's the seed, the word of God, that begets. And where the word of God has not gone, there are no Christians. So if there's to be faith in Christ as there ought to be, then the word of God must go to those people that need it, and they must understand it. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So he has begotten us again unto a lively hope. Notice the focus here is the future. Many times we say, isn't it wonderful to have been baptized into Christ for the mix of sin, the Lord's added to the church, we're his children. But Peter focuses on eternity here, that he's begotten us unto a lively or a living hope. The expectation of eternity with God in a glorified body as the resurrected Christ now has. In a place where we're beyond the tempter's snare, there is no Satan, there is no sickness, there is no death, there are no murders and thieves and wars and rumors of wars. There's nothing like that. There's no growing old. There's nothing that this world has to offer now. All that's laid aside. And so we have that living hope. We don't emphasize enough about how hope helps us look way over beyond the misery of this life. 
and we can see the reward through the truth of God. And that's what Peter wants these people who are going to suffer for the cause of Christ to realize. A, live, a, li a living hope, a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ the dead. So people who obey the gospel, who live faithful, knowing Christ was raised from the dead to die no more, then we too shall enjoy that resurrection. And therein we ought to focus. And notice the nature of it in verse 4. To an inheritance. Incorruptible. Now, various ones of us, maybe in somebody's will, and some of us may have already inherited something of this present world. But all of that's still going to be going to It's all going to be destroyed. But Peter says the hope that you have because you're faithful to the Lord is a hope that is incorruptible. It's undefiled. That fadeth not away. Where is it? Reserved. You have reserved place in heaven. Reserved in heaven for you. We ought to read these very personally as children of God. We ought to read it like it was written to you or to me. And think of the fact that we have a place by the God of all the universe reserved for us as faithful children in heaven with him. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's no maybes. It's reserved for us. So let the world do what it may to us because we love and obey the Lord. Because we tell them how they can also have the same thing. Let them persecute us. Then there comes to mind what Jesus said. They can't do anything but kill your body. The real you, the spirit that God formed in you when you were conceived, will always exist and will someday be resurrected into a glorified body to dwell in heaven in the presence of God forever. Well, when you're being persecuted like these people, this is a source of encouragement that's above and beyond about anything else I can think of. Notice you are kept by the power of God, verse 5, through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed for the last time. Last time. Well, our faith is so significant. It's our trust in God and in his word and in his system, the gospel system, to save us from past sins when we're baptized into Christ. It's penitent to believe it, penitent to believe it. And then to preserve us in Christ as we live according to the teaching of the New Testament and as we head on down through life, however long that will be before it terminates. But it's a wonderful thing to see that there is a power beyond any power this world knows that men could conjure up. But more than that, it's stronger than any power that Satan could ever bring up. And so we see that we're kept by that power. Whose power? Power of God. But it's dependent upon our faith through. There's the avenue whereby we're kept by that power. That's what that preposition means, through. That's the avenue through which it works. It works through faith. It works through the system of faith that Jude said we're to contend for, Jude 3. But it works through our individual faith. And I rather think that's what he speaks of here. Our personal faith in God in Christ, the Bible and the gospel system that motivates us to obey him and serve him, even if it costs us our life. And he says, now, there's a certain time. You know, we noticed in Galatians 4, 4, that there was a particular time in the history of man for Christ to come into this world that was the exact time for him to do that. In the fullness of time. But do you realize what's being said here? ready to be revealed at the last time? There is an exact right time in human history for it to end. God knows when that is. And that's when the resurrection will take place. And for the faithful, heaven will be their home in a resurrected body of even like Christ presently possesses. As John said, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him. But we shall see him as he is. 
Now notice, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Sometimes, if not all the time, the worst treatment in the way of persecution that we get, then the more we focus on the things that are eternal, the things that can't be troubled by this present world, the finite things, those are the things we can rejoice in. I don't think that the faithful child of God and all that that means, if he or she has the presence of mind just before they depart this world, that they're going to be wondering about what they're going to plant in the garden or what kind of car they want or the bills that are due or anything like that. I think they will be thinking about that vast eternity. And how have I lived that I can enjoy the glory of God in heaven? And that's the way we ought to rule our lives always regarding the physical things of the transit, even our time here as pilgrims in this present world. Notice he's focusing in, in verse 7, on their faith. But notice how he says it, that the trial of your faith, these this heaviness and manifold trials of temptation, it puts our faith on trial. How strong is it? Do we have the strength of faith to pass the test when our very lives are being threatened because simply we're Christians? So we need to view Trouble like that. Trouble that comes upon us because we preach the truth, we defend the faith, and we won't be moved off of the idea of doing all things by the authority of the Lord. The trial of your faith. So that tells me that our faith is under trial always in this life. We're in a state of probation. And you can see then now why James in James chapter 2 we spend so much time with those Christians about what is a living faith over and against a dead faith. And of course, we see that a living faith is an obedient faith. And he wanted those Christians to be actively obeying Christ concerning the things that Christians are to do. So he, we'll have to be stopping here in a moment that the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perishes. So it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That doesn't end the sentence there, it goes on. But we all know that if you want to purify gold, you have to burn the impurities out of it. So Peter is making it very clear that as we labor to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, as we labor to bring every thought and subjection to Christ, as we labor to set our affections on things above and not on things of this earth, as we labor to realize and always remember every day that we're to be obedient to Christ, to have a living, active, obedient faith, not a dead thing, that we're on probation. That's the design and purpose of life. So that we can grow to be more like Christ. And when we are going to be more like Christ, the impurities must be burned out. So all these manifold trials, if we will hold on to the truth, not deviating to the left hand or to the right, just walking the straight and narrow way of divine truth, then the Lord will take care of the rest. And that's a great peaceful confidence that we ought to have. Well, our time is about up tonight. We will pause here and continue from this verse, verse 7, Lord willing, in our next time together. But before we end the class, let's go to Heavenly Father and pray. Our Holy Father, we humbly bow before thy throne.
thankful for this time together in which we can focus more on the eternal things and not on the things of this world. Help us, Father, that we will face the manifold trials of our faith and that we will prove to thee that we love thee with all that we are and have and that our faith is strong and always will lead us to obey thee in taking thee at thy word. Help us to pray without ceasing and in all things of prayer and supplication with thanksgiving thank our request made known to thee. Bear us up and strengthen us through problem time, but to always help us remember the sojourners we're pilgrims, we're strangers in this world. Help us to hold the gospel tenaciously and follow after things that make for peace. And with those who've been mentioned that are ill, help them according to thy wisdom. Strengthen us to bolster one another up in the fellowship we have in Christ. We pray it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.